Kia ora koutou katoa, welcome back. The conversations that have taken place here in the Aotea Centre have addressed some of the biggest challenges and opportunities for the APEC region in the current climate. And while the APEC CEO Summit might have wrapped for 2021, the conversation isn't over. I'm Tim McCready and I'm here to ask this next panel, what have we learnt and break down some of the key highlights and insights from the more than 50 economic leaders, keynote speakers and panellists that we have heard from. Joining me on the panel today are Fran O'Sullivan, a highly respected business and political commentator for the New Zealand Herald and head of business for NZME. She's a frequent attendee at APEC and a participant in regional dialogues involving New Zealand. We also have Brent Wilton, director of Tuhana Business and Human Rights Limited. He has represented many companies on labour and human rights issues, most recently with the Coca-Cola Company as the global director of human and workplace rights. And Hannah Patello, a finance and economics graduate from Victoria University of Wellington. She represented New Zealand at APEC Voices of the Future in Papua New Guinea in 2018 and was involved in facilitating this year's program right here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Welcome to you all. To begin, I would love to ask you all for your key insights that we've heard from the business leaders over the last two days. Uh, perhaps Brent, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure, Tim. I mean, it's very difficult to pull out just particular themes from what has been a very, very robust conversation. I think the organisers need to be congratulated very deeply for what they've been able to achieve in bringing those voices to the table. I think one of the key things that's come out from me is the realisation that whilst business has a positive role to play, it can't do it alone. Uh, there is a need to ensure that government remains very much at the table to bring about the policy requirements which are necessary to enable business to succeed. I think the need for more voice, and I think that came across through a number of the speakers, including from the heads of state, that we need more people in the conversation. I think the other thing that came through, and John Denton from the International Chamber of Commerce raised this, is making the multilateral system fit for purpose for the new purpose. Because as we build back better, we can't build back on the same structures that obviously have not been working for us for a while. So I think there is a key opportunity for this region and the leaders in this region and the business community in this region to really start to drive what that new multilateral structure could look like for the future. Yeah, that's right. And I'll, I want to come back to that point actually uh, soon, but perhaps, Fran, would you like to share some of your key insights? Yeah, I guess for me, it's probably the economic leaders. Um, that's one of the reasons I've been to APEC so many times, and it's to get an insight on where they're coming from, uh, you know, the, the big visions they have, how they're connecting with each other, what the challenges are. And I think leading into uh, the conversations which will be taking place in New Zealand overnight, uh, at the APEC leaders meeting, we do get a sense of the polarity that's occurring between the Western and democracies and also China. But also, uh, to me, the big, big stars were uh, Xi Jinping. He turned up and uh, that's, you know, that's to be fated. But also he made a point that he didn't want to see the region riven by ideological disputes. And some would say, well, he's contributed to that. But um, I think he made a, a good point about this is no time for a Cold War. And interestingly, while this summit has been occurring, uh, one really positive thing to see was that he and, uh, or more particularly China and also the US have combining on climate change. And, and that's fantastic because that is one of the big challenges that we've heard about over the last couple of days. Uh, like Brent, the multilateral um, issue was for me a highlight. And John Denton, who I have seen in, in many, many, many fora, and he, bless his heart, was ro robust as ever. Uh, he basically um, got to the point and said, you know, the WTO, in so many words, was in crisis. It had a constitutional issue in front of it. He was very, very direct about the need for collaboration and also for governments to let business into the table. And we've seen that. I mean, this is the era of big state. Governments are back. They're the only ones who could really deal with a crisis. They have, you know, they have the wherewithal and the kitty. But however, the ideas also come from the private sector. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And Hannah, beaming into this beautiful set all the way from Wellington, how are you? And what were your key insights? I'm um, good, thanks. Um, thanks for having me on this panel. It's it's really awesome to be joining you, Fran and Brent. I mean, yeah, it's it's been a crazy two days. I think the big focus on Indigenous communities and the Indigenous economy uh, was a real highlight and maybe something that hasn't been seen as much in past CEO summits. So I think New Zealand's done a really fantastic job of getting this on the agenda. And again, it comes back to, you know, inclusivity and including more people in the conversation. Um, and another thing, Brent kind of touched on this, 
is that inherent need for business and governments to collaborate. And, you know, this is where we're going to achieve the most constructive and, and sustainable solutions, um, but also collaborating with the community and having them at the heart of that. So, yeah, a lot of key takeaways, but those would be my two um, top ones. Mm, thank you. Uh, I know that one, one of the big themes from this year's summit was, of course, state of the world and recovery post-COVID. We had that great interview with um, PwC's Bob Moritz uh, and, of course, Alan Bollard's uh, panel discussion. Fran, do you think, uh, after what you've heard over the past two days, how well-placed is the Asia-Pacific uh, for that post-COVID recovery? I think it's well-placed, but both men put huge caveats around, around that. And we, we saw, I think Alan made the comment that uh, growth in the last uh, quarter had been 10%. And the forecast out of APEC Secretariat for its regional uh, forecast is for 6% in the current year. However, there's caveats around that and caveats around political will, political leadership uh, to make sure things stay on the road. Uh, the issue also around, um, you know, the return of potentially of COVID and Helen Clark raised the issue of a fourth surge, which is happening in Europe. And obviously Angela Merkel has been facing that in her last few weeks as chancellor. But, um, you know, you did get the sense of listening to it, that uh, to the whole summit, that there was an enormous amount of innovative um, head of steam there that just needs to be broken out and allowed to play. But against that, you know, it's it's the global governance. It's a whole range of things, you know, moving to what are the kind of questions about how we open up the borders again, all that. And I think there's some big challenges. Big challenges. And of course, that question mark over whether or not we ever will be in a post-COVID era. <laughs> um, Hannah, a question for you. You've spent the last few months working with uh, Voices of the Future uh, delegates um, leading one of the groups there. How have the themes at the CEO Summit this year aligned with what uh, youth are talking about and interested in? Um, yeah, well, I mean, we covered four themes and they were, you know, the big meaty themes of um, the digital future, climate change, international cooperation and inclusivity. So as you can imagine, um, they were all covered in the CEO Summit. Uh, I think one thing that definitely stuck out to me is and we use this exact word was we cannot have a siloed focus. And I know a few people said that in the summit, and we definitely talked a lot about that in the um, Voices program as well, is that we've got people, we've got planet, we've got the economy. They're all inextricably linked. And, you know, we need to focus on all of them in an equal way um, to ensure that that we can grow and, and actually find some solutions to these really big problems that we're, that we're facing. And another thing um, that sort of resonated with me is that we can all make statements and we've made statements in the youth declaration and, you know, business leaders and, and government leaders have made statements, but we actually need substance behind those statements and, and actions and concrete actions um, now, not just 20 years into the future. So I think that's something that we'll be thinking about the youth um, and something that, you know, government and business leaders should also be thinking about as well. Mm. Uh Great response. One of the other things that we heard through the summit that um, that we should all be thinking about as businesses, of course, ESG, and it was it was one of the uh, most popular uh, panel discussions, judging by the comments that were coming in on the uh, on the online platform. Uh, that whole concept of ESG being tied into business as a force for good, uh, also human rights, of course. Brent, I know this is an area that you're quite passionate about and you've worked in. How heartening is it to see it becoming such an integral part of the conversation? Oh, I think it's great, and I think. For businesses moving forward, the fact that it is now ESG is very important. Not just E, not just G, not just S, but the three together. But I think there is still a risk of it being looked at in silos. So you need to make sure that we're looking to integrate ESG as one word, not three initials, so that we are able to actually bring about the change. Because you have to work across all, all of the organisation in order to make this real. But it's very heartening. But it's also important that governments and also um, companies understand what they say now matters. And if they're saying too much and delivering too little, they are going to come into real conflict very quickly with communities, stakeholders, their own employees and others. So it's important that as you're looking at ESG that you are measured in how you approach it and don't over, as we used to say, egg the custard to make it too rich when they can't deliver on the promises they're making. Mm. And that is actually something that was coming through a lot on the platform. People are saying there's a lot of talk going on you know, about ESG. Every company's you know, beginning to talk about it. Uh, but how much action, and this is a question for the whole panel, how much action are we actually uh, seeing business take, or is it all talk? Um, I, I don't think it's all talk. 
I think companies in, are still struggling to understand it, including here in New Zealand. I mean, there are so many big issues facing business at the moment. I mean, with respect, I don't think I'd like to be a CEO of a large company or even a small company in the current environment with so many issues to deal with. But I think if we are able to look at some of the structures that are being established now to help business do this, government has a role to help business do this. And I think also if we start to look at some of the other tools like the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, which provide frameworks for these things to be realised, to turn the talk into action. Because if it's not actionable, then I'm sorry, it's not worth the consideration. Mm. Fran, what's your readout on this? Well, I've probably got a contrary view. I think uh, New Zealand is doing quite well in some areas. We've seen, for instance, the Aotearoa uh, circle. We've seen sustainable finance. They're having a move uh, next year on energy. And, and these are the CEOs of some fairly large companies um, who have got together with the finance um, sector to actually make um, actionable points. Uh, Reserve Bank, uh, quite unlike some of the central banks around the world, also taking a leadership role. Government actually having uh, saying it's going to introduce guidelines for how um, you know, uh, government fund agencies invest their money. So I think there is a big shift that's really well underway here. It might be um, harder for the smaller end of town to deal with, but I certainly think corporates have got it fair and square. Mm. Hannah, I'd like to ask you, one of the other big things that kept uh, coming up, of course, was digital innovation, one of the big topics of, um, of this year's CEO Summit. Uh, and uh, what was it that Amber Mack called a, a relentless adaptation that's going on? Uh, how, what, what does the next generation think about this and what do they want to see in that digital space into the future? Yeah, I mean, this is a huge topic and I felt like uh, the digital theme was, was almost talked about in every single keynote or panel discussion. I think one thing, and especially uh, we talked about it in the Voices discussion as well, is that whilst we've got all this innovation and this, you know, as you say, relentless adaptation and big tech and that kind of thing, we still have um, this digital divide or digital equity. And we've seen this exacerbated through COVID-19. You know, those who were privileged to be online could could still continue with their education or move their businesses online. And those that weren't online have become very vulnerable and exposed. So I think until we get to grips with this digital equity, then you know, this digital innovation isn't going to be as meaningful because it's not it's not shared by everyone. And actually a quote that Amber Max said, not in the CEO summit, but um she said the the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. So you know, a, a lot of these technologies are here, but they're not evenly distributed. So that's um, something that is, is a big focus for us, definitely. Mm, and really important across the, the APEC economies, of course. Uh, I'd like to, of course, we can't talk about the APEC CEO Summit without talking all of, about all of the big leaders that were here uh, speaking. Uh, first of all, question for you, Fran, uh, the President of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping, uh, he spoke. How, how big a deal is that for New Zealand? How should we feel about him speaking at our summit? Well, I think we, we should be um, uh, pretty pleased that, that he's done so. Um, you know, he uh, sent a statement, I think, to one or two of those other uh, meetings uh, that have been happening globally. They come to G20, of course, and uh, COP26 have also been bracketing this but to actually have him um, you know visually there delivering his statement and also a statement which is really quite important on the eve of the actual APEC leaders meeting calling for unity falling for cooperation you know the big challenges of our time uh, staking out that uh, comment uh, that he did about no time for a Cold War. Now, everyone's thinking about this because you've got two different constructs um, happening at the moment. You've got uh, the United States pushing the Indo-Pacific and, of course, APEC still very much Asia-Pacific. So, you know, a bit of warning bell around there. And interesting, of course, when the um, United States is aiming to host APEC um, in 2023. So a bit of geopolitics, but put that to one side. I, I thought the messaging was was very um, apposite really for this and I think it was very good to be able to have a leader of that weight addressing the summit in the middle of a pandemic virtually. Mm, absolutely and I'd love to know uh, from the other panellists other other uh, leaders of APEC economies that you heard from that you found interesting or inspiring. Brent would you? Well I was interested to hear from the president of Peru he's a new person in the market so to speak so it was very interesting to hear what his point of view was in terms of some of these issues as also a forthcoming host of APEC himself. I also thought hearing from the likes of the Philippines and Indonesia was also very heartening. 
Uh, they're facing some particular challenges themselves, but I think that there is solidarity there amongst the leaders about what needs to be done. The question is going to be how do we within the APEC community mm. do our best to support everyone, to Hannah's point, so that everyone can benefit in the future, not just those who have access to it. Mm. And how about you, Hannah? What, uh, what APEC leader did you uh, most enjoy hearing from? Um, yeah, well, I guess looking back on it now, and I didn't quite expect it, but I actually thought Scott Morrison said a few quite uh, interesting points around the digital environment and taking a pragmatic approach um, to, you know, ensuring that it's a safe space. He talked about freedom of speech, but not being able to say what you want without being accountable, which is key. And um, also from a couple of other leaders, also um, Mismi's were, were, were talked about quite a lot, which which is really cool for the younger audience because I think a lot of us are starting to embark on our sort of entrepreneurial or, or business um, time. So it's awesome to hear that leaders are thinking about Ms. Mies and how to support them and guide them through a COVID or post-COVID world. Mm. Fran, um, Brent mentioned uh, President Pedro Castillo from Peru. I know that you're, you follow uh, what's going on in uh, Latin America. Uh, what, do you think, what did you think of what he said? It's his first APEC summit. He's only been in power for three months. What, what, what did you make of it? Oh, I was pretty impressed. And he also had a sales job to come, um, not just on uh, hosting APEC itself, which, of course, he's made a bid for, um, you know, in uh, 2024. But also three months into the role, um, he's come at a critical juncture in some of the LATAM economies. They've been led by centre-right politicians for quite a long time. And uh, he's very de definitely leftist. He's got a striking uh, visit he wears his hat or sombrero or whatever it is. And he, but um, I think what he was doing was quite a stout defence of what he's trying to do. Um, this is an economy which has had the worst, um, you know, COVID um, uh, response in, in the world. I mean, it, it has had the highest death rate per capita. It is really in deep deep um, straits. And so it, he's got a big challenge in front of him. I, I felt he was making a bid for investment into his country. He was trying to tone down uh, suspicions also that basically he would embark on a wave of nationalisation, which is what people said when he came to power. But I thought he was impressive. He um, took the opportunity. He held the camera. Yeah, I think he was, um, he was actually one of the stars of the show. I think everyone's sort of talking about him after that, and, and I'm not sure that everybody knew who he was uh, ahead of his address. <laughs> Speaking of stars of the show, of course, Angela Merkel, we heard from her today um, in her conversation with Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. And I really loved what she said about decisions being made at home having a ripple effect on uh, the planet, which is, of course, tr true for uh, the environment as well as the pandemic. Let's take a quick look at what she said. Never before have we been able to realise how interconnected we are globally. What is happening here influences what is happening in Africa, in New Zealand and in the United States of America. And that sense of how small our globe actually is when it looks to the spread of such a virus, I think that should continue to guide us when we tackle issues like biodiversity and climate protection. Wasn't that a fantastic interview? And I'd like to uh, get reflections uh, from the panel on that discussion, which I think as well as tra uh, talk, you know, speaking to the environment and the, the pandemic covered data use and leadership in general. Uh, Brent, why don't you go first and tell us what your, uh, your takeouts from that was? Well, I think um, the Chancellor Merkel was very clear and very correct in saying, no one's going to do this alone. We've either all got to do it or we're all going to fail. And I think in terms of the conversations that need to occur, between all of the regions now become more imperative. We can, we're not going to change climate down here in New Zealand on its own. And I think how you build that collaboration globally and coming back a bit to what John Denton said about the multilateral system supporting that is going to be key because if, if Germany fails, we're going to fail. If America fails, China's going to fail. There are no winners if this goes wrong. But I think one of the other things I took from the conversation with her and our Prime Minister was this issue about how we talk to people. I think we have to be a little bit more respectful in how we engage in conversations. And it's a bit what Hannah was saying about John Morrison and saying, you know, we need to make sure that we are respectful in the interchanges we have. Because if we don't have that respect to start the conversation, there's not going to be a conversation. Everyone will retreat to their own corners mm. and will make no progress whatsoever. And let's be honest, time is against us. We need quick policy outcomes now done through a very inclusive process which has business and others at the table as they're developed. Mm, didn't we hear that passionately from David Suzuki as well? Correct. Hannah, could I come to you next for your reflections on that, that conversation between uh, Angela Merkel and, and Jacinda Ardern? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it was great, and it was it was so cool seeing two amazing female leaders up there as well. Um, I guess I I really took away a lot from when they were talking about leadership, and um, Merkel talked about you know understanding what makes others tick and where their perspective is, and, and trying to understand that first before kind of trying to negotiate you know a deal or something with them. Um, and as Jacinda said, you know, the willingness to hear the perspective of others is the reflection of a true leader to engage in conversation, open dialogue and be transparent. So I think those are all key things that I will definitely take away for myself and I hope others take away as well. Mm. And Fran, you wrote recently about this conversation coming at a, a mon momentous time in, uh, in global affairs. What, what did you make of the conversation? Well, I, I, you know, I, I took it and I watched it and I thought, gosh, you know, what a shame she's going. Uh, huge vacuum. She's been there 16 years. She's been the rock of Europe. Uh, she's warned in recent commentary about, um, you know, waves of nationalism. Can you, you know, and but potential for a second world war, the lessons having to be learned. And then again, she didn't frame that up today, but, um, you know, she was talking quite differently. But it's sort of part of a you know, kind of like a, a swan song of major addresses she's been making over the last few weeks. And this one took it a bit further in the personal sense. But um, she is going to be, um, you know, leave a gap there. And you could see the way she kind of calibrates how she approaches people and how she's managed to just be at that apex for so long. So I think any, any leader wanting to have longevity in an area, you know, where you've got to bring a lot of nation states together should be looking at her. Yeah, and um, I think that was demonstrated when she said she was there at COP1. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> where we're now at COP26. Um, I guess speaking of uh, climate, Hannah, I'd like to put a question to you about that conversation with Jerome Foster. I really enjoyed speaking with him and um, he, he spoke about how important it is for leaders to listen to younger voices. Do you think that uh, their voices are being heard and is business listening? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, Jerome, well, such an um, inspiration. And yeah, I, I think they are, and and more so. I mean, a good example of it is we've New Zealand has set the tone, and our voices program, our youth declaration was handed to the chair of APEC, um, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, and this is the first time that it has been handed to the chair. And I really hope that this continues to happen at subsequent um, programs. So it's cool that New Zealand can can be on the forefront of that and really set the tone. Um, and actually, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said that you'd be surprised by how many times a youth voice has influenced her decision making. So I hope that we can lead the way with that. And I think Jerome also said, you know, the youth voice is important. If we're resilient and we show up, we will be listened eventually. And, and he is such a good example of that. You know, he did how many climate strikes um, and then... You know, he's the youngest advisor to the Biden administration. So there's a long way to go, but we're definitely getting there. Mm. And um, just sort of on that thread, I'd like to just ask the, the whole panel uh, what you all think in terms of our efforts to tackle climate change as a, as a region. You know, we heard, we've heard this urgency at COP26. We've spoken about it here at the Apex CEO Summit. Uh, and we've heard about technologies like hydrogen that'll be, you know, potentially coming on board, electric vehicles. Robin Denholm from Tesla gave that great keynote speech. How, how are we going with that? Well, I think we've got um, a heck of a long way to go. And it is obviously one of the issues in front of the leaders tonight uh, when they speak. Climate change is, is here and now. It's a major issue. Uh, effectively, we've failed so far as a region to uh, make huge headway on this. There have been big statements of purpose now. Uh, from out of the United States and China, which is essential, uh, but also what's essential is, you know, kind of letting the innovative um, spirit come free, a big focus on green innovation from economies and businesses, and um, also the kind of um, things which governments can do, which m moving away from fossil fuel subsidies, which, you know, is something APEC is, is tackling. But there's a long way to go, and listening to David Suzuki, you did get the sense it was a giant fail so far. Mm, mm, something he's been campaigning on his whole yeah. his whole lifetime, right? Any, anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think in terms of where we are, I agree with Fran, we're, we've got a long way to go. And I think there's a huge role for education in this. Um, it was talked about the role of government and the government having the responsibility 
as a legitimate representative of the people to do the varying balancing acts that have to occur in terms of policy. But government has to set expectations with their populations. Uh, we cannot expect to continue to live the lives we've led till now if we're going to get anywhere close to 1.5 as the goal. That means people are going to have to be told, because they won't do it willingly, that certain ways of living are no longer going to be acceptable. That's tough for any politician to deal with. And I think the more cohesion we can have as a region around tackling some of those issues, the better. Because it's always a situation, you move first, then I'll move. And if you haven't moved first, I'm not moving. And so how do you actually get beyond that inertia occasioned by someone not wanting to be first? So how do we move it together? Mm. And Hannah, Hannah, what would you say about that? What is the younger generation thinking about, or, or the, the younger generation that you've been working with at the Voices of the uh, Future in particular, what do they think about the, uh, the future prospect for the climate at the moment? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, kind of echo what Fran and, and Brent have said. I think, again, there are a lot of statements or promises that are quite far in advance. That means maybe we're not taking the immediate actions required to actually um, hit those goals and targets. And I think Robin from uh, Tesla was saying that as well. So, you know, I think it's about concrete actions immediate actions and, and not just thinking about 2050 because we actually need to think about now and yeah we talked a lot about education as well um, climate justice fossil fuel subsidies all things really front of mind uh, in the youth side of things so yeah mm. Fran I'd like to turn to you now we were talking just prior to this panel and I believe this is your 15th CEO summit uh, you were also on the CEO summit board in 1999 when it was last hosted here in New Zealand could you tell us a little bit about what's changed and, and how you found this summit uh, compared to that one all the way back in 1999? Well, I guess obviously we're holding it virtually. Um, but however, I mean, it was different back then because China was out in the world pretty much for the first time. It was pre the WTO. So the China delegation was only about 13 people coming down to New Zealand, bigger delegations elsewhere from the region. It was off the back of the Asian financial crisis. So again, at a time of crisis, again, New Zealand's role to bring some unity, uh, to take it forward, because the year prior in Kuala Lumpur had been a wipeout. Um, you know, there were sort of major issues there. So I think New Zealand performed a hugely good role there. Uh, it was intimate. There were characters who came to town. And, um, you know, obviously people like Bill Clinton and so forth, and Jiang Zemin, the then, um, uh, you know, uh, president of China, who even played the piano at one evening function. So it had intimacy, it, it had a kind of relatability. But so does this, and in a different way, uh, because it is being done virtually. You are seeing uh, people close up, you're engaged. Uh, if you're going to a normal APEC CEO summit meeting, generally people will come in for sessions that interest them. Then they'll go off and, and network or go with their government delegations and do lobbying and do deals and all of that. This is quite different. It, it gives you a very intimate insight uh, into what's happening and also, you know, has brought younger people and all sorts of other issues into. And I think it's, I think it's also been great branding for New Zealand. There's been wonderful vignettes. Um, it's presented the New Zealand story and the New Zealand brand in a very captivating and engaging way. So there's big differences, but also wonderful similarities of just what that New Zealand spirit is. Mm. And I'd love to ask the, uh, the other two on the panel, uh, how you found the summit, and in particular that what Fran was saying there, you know, normally uh, when we host the APEC CEO summit, we're expecting tens of thousands of people to come to town. Uh, and we get to show off Aotearoa New Zealand. Of course, it's a little bit different this time, but I know there was a lot of effort made uh, to really portray uh, New Zealand to the world. How do you think that went across, uh, Brent? Well, I think it went very, very well. And, and to Fran's point, I think instead of people wandering around the halls, there was a more focused discussion around some of these key themes that I think you wouldn't necessarily have in an in-person meeting. I think the challenge going forward is when we get back into in-person meetings, how do we maintain the benefits of the virtual as much as anything? I think also that what I've seen here needs to be on New Zealand television. I mean, people need to see this. The vignettes that, that Fran just talked about, fascinating. Things I had not seen or was aware of that more people need to understand as part of this education that we need to take forward. But I think New Zealand has shown that it is able to be an inclusive partner in this space, a trusted 
partner in this space. And I think moving forward, even though APEC may move to another state in terms of a host, there is a real key role for New Zealand to continue to build on what's been built here. Mm, mm, get this on, on TV. We'll have, to, we'll have a word with the executive director yeah. of the summit about that. I'd watch uh, it again. <laughs> uh, Hannah, how about you? How did, it, how did it go for you? Do you think, how do you think New Zealand was portrayed and what was that online experience like with what I think was uh, the most ever uh, Voices of the Future delegates to attend a CEO summit? Yeah, for sure. Um, I was going to touch on that. I mean, I, I actually have to laugh because never would I have thought that I would be attending a premier conference in my university flat, in my bedroom. Um, and it's, it's honestly crazy. And yeah, because it's been online, we've been able to have all 21 economies involved um, and also a wider New Zealand delegation join us for the summit. So it's arguably been the most inclusive and accessible uh, for the wider region, which, which has been really cool. And to the New Zealand image, I mean, I love New Zealand <laughs> and it's, I just, you know, the Chia sisters, Sir Ian Taylor with animation research, you know, we're a small nation, but we, we stack up pretty well and we do some pretty cool things down here. Uh, I loved Stephen Colbert's attempt at speaking Kiwi. Uh, it was pretty funny and it just shows our unique New Zealand culture, our community and, and that we don't always take ourselves too seriously. So, and also some really key messages from our premier sponsors as well. So I think, you know, Apex just done an incredible, incredible job of putting New Zealand on the a global stage. Mm. And uh, we have just about five minutes uh, left. So I might just do a sweep right across the panel and ask you all, what do you think the biggest change uh, that business should be making? Uh, what, would you, what would you suggest to business that they should really be thinking about from everything that we've heard at this year's uh, Apex CEO Summit? Hannah, I'll, I'll come back to you first. Um, I'm going to have to go with the, the ESG, and it's, it's just so important, I think, especially the young generation, Gen Z, uh, as Jonathan Haidt said, you know, we are true liberals, apparently, and we are demanding for social change. We're demanding for that social agenda. We want businesses to look past the bottom line, past profits, and put people and planet first. So if, if anything, I think that is the biggest thing for businesses to take away from this, for sure. Mm. How about you, Brent? What's what's your one message to business? Well, Hannah just took my <laughs> yeah, point, I was going to so say thank that. You for that. <laughs> I think we're all just about mute. No, not yeah. at all. I think one of the things that came through from me was the need for companies to be listening more, perhaps speaking less, but listening more. How do you bring those different voices into a business in a meaningful way? Business spends a lot of time talking to itself, and I think there is a real benefit. And Hannah mentioned it around the youth voice, the indigenous voice, the voice of labour the workforce. There's a lot that uh, business needs to be thinking about, about how do you build that inclusivity that you need in order for the ESG to gel within the business and to have the support of the communities for that business to continue to grow in a way which is responsible to its people. Mm, and on that note, wasn't it fantastic to have that Indigenous voice and that, that final panel as well talking about Indigenous inclusion? Um, I think this is the first CEO summit where that's been sort of on the, on, on the table as an important topic. Fran, I'll come to you and let you uh, have the last word. In what, terms of business? What would, you, what would you tell business after watching the last two days? Well, I'll echo um, the comments of my fellow panellists, but I'd, I'd also say, you know, to get out of your nation boundaries, at least virtually, look at what's happening in the world, look at the trends. I learnt so much over the last, um, you know, couple of days. Um, there's a lot happening there. Uh, all the um, issues around um, addressing, um, you know, rising costs, supply chains, all of that, they're still very, very um, necessary. And it's very, very necessary to get um, some global rules of the game. And I think business needs to be pushing its nation state leaders or economy leaders to get on and do that. It's really essential. Mm. And I think that it's a really fantastic place to leave it. I just want to thank all three panellists for joining. Hannah, for coming in from your bedroom there in Wellington. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, and, um, very and tidy bedroom too. Very, very tidy bedroom. <laughs> uh, and coming up next, we have a panel discussion that will be moderated by Zaina Jalil. Uh, and she's going to ask, what does this all mean? What's next for New Zealand? But thanks for joining. And thank you all uh, very much for thank being you. here today. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.
enga mana, enga waka, enga reo, e rau rangatira ma. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. My name is Zaina Jalil and it is an absolute pleasure to be here reflecting on the deliberations and discussions at the APEC CEO Summit and considering what next for New Zealand. We are at an important crossroads, facing a trifecta of challenges, climate, COVID and conflict. Our people are facing fear, frustration and fatigue. These are complex challenges which require more than minor tweaking. But with challenge comes opportunity. The opportunity to reconnect and transform. Over the last two days, we have heard from leaders of countries, of businesses, thought leaders and young leaders. They've talked about the need to cooperate, to innovate, to rebuild trust. They've talked about ensuring that our recovery is sustainable, inclusive and resilient. It's been inspiring. But inspiration needs action to turn vision into reality. So I'm thrilled to have with me now three amazing Kiwi leaders to discuss what's next for New Zealand. Sir Peter Gluckman is president of the International Science Council and head of COITU, an independent and apolitical think tank and research center based at the University of Auckland. He was the inaugural chief science advisor to the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Our next panelist is Teresa Gatting, CNZM, an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and chair of AIA New Zealand, TEND, Telco Technology Services, and Global Women. She is the former CEO of Telecom New Zealand, a position she held for seven years. And rounding out our panel, we have Christina Leaf, who descends from the tribes of Te Rarawa, Te Hikutu, Ngāpuhi, and Eitutaki. She serves a Taitamariki young people to remember and reclaim the entrepreneurial whakapapa genealogy through intentional indigenous-led kaupapa program design and delivery. Kia ora and welcome. New Zealand's opportunity to host APEC comes around once every 21 years. And I'm especially mindful of that because I moved to New Zealand 21 years ago. In that time, our country has changed immensely. As a society, we are aging. By 2036, 22% of New Zealanders are expected to be aged 65 plus. We are increasingly more ethnically diverse too. We are home to more than 213 ethnicities and 160 languages. Almost 40% of Kiwis identify as Maori, Pacific or Asian. A quarter of us weren't born here. And here in Auckland, it's nearly 45%. One in four have disabilities. I could go on, but you get the picture. Throughout the CEO Summit, we have talked about the importance of inclusion. As the diversity of worldviews and values mix, they can bring a richness of experience and innovation, both elements which can play a critical role as we work on COVID recovery, <coughs> on digital transformation, on the sustainability imperative and the future of energy. But diversity can also increase polarization as identities and values collide. This has implications on a range of levels, not least an epidemic of misinformation and mistrust of societal institutions. We are of course seeing some of this play out in terms of the vaccine drive. I'm really keen to hear our panel's thoughts on what they see as being the next steps for New Zealand, given the challenges and opportunities before us. So Peter, let's start with you. What do you see as New Zealand's place in the world? Well, it's got to rebuild its place in the world. Our geographical isolation has, for the last 18 months, been a significant advantage. But we've somewhat isolated ourselves from the world in that time. And it's really urgent that we reconnect our leaders, our entrepreneurs, our business people, our young people need to be able to reconnect with the world. We face the challenges you mentioned in your introduction, and those challenges will impact us in other ways. Climate change that it means that it's inevitable that reliance on ruminant production as we know it now will decline over coming decades. A high volume tourism is likely to be displaced, displaced by, by, because of climate change and the development of the metaverse. 
in, uh, export education will change because of what people have learned to do over the last two years. So we need to remove our relatively passive approach to our position in the world and see that we must become much more actively engaged with an urgency because these transitions and transformations that are going on around us will lead us behind if we don't think about it more aggressively. Small countries can't do everything and we need partners and that's why APEC is so important. But we need also to partner with other like-minded countries, with other small advanced economies to save the way forward. And you wouldn't be surprised that in that regard, I regard decisions we've made over the last 30 years to diverge from other countries in not sufficiently investing in upstream R&D, spending about half as much as comparable countries around the world, like Singapore, like Taiwan, like Japan, like Korea, Israel and so forth, on R&D from the public sector. Despite the rhetoric that we would do so, has left us well behind the scene. Yes, we have a few unicorns and we should celebrate those. But, but we know that our productivity is relatively low. We know that we need to use technologies different. And we need to try and pick up the pace as the pace of technology around the world moves so quickly. I worry that we do not have an integrated strategy for AI and the other advanced technologies. I sat on the OECD committee that said that every government could, should put its digital strategy right in the centre of government. It's still disparate and on the peripheral side of government. Contra think of when quantum as quantum emerges, more forms of AI and so forth. It will impact on every part of our economy, our society and our environment and our own health. We don't have the kind of selective industrial strategy that other countries have taken to take advantage. And yet small countries have done that elsewhere. On the other hand, the upside is we have advantages. Look at the, the big companies that have moved to Auckland to set up data centres. Apple's now got an R&D centre in Auckland and so forth. There are opportunities here. We haven't taken advantage of our positioning adequately. The th other point I would make is we're a biologically based economy. Yes, it will change because climate change will force change. But we will not be able to compete in that space unless we think again about technology and the role that technology will play in biological future food security around the world. And that means conversations we're not very good at having. Conversations, everything we know about climate change, about everything else involves trade-offs. And we're going to have to think about the position of our agricultural comp, uh, 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 economy in that sense. Yes, we face environmental degradation. We face climate change. Technologies can change the balance between those and our economic needs. So COVID, has taught, COVID should have taught us all something. And it is nothing simple. There's always going to be trade-offs. There'll be diff diverse views on how to proceed. But as you said in your introduction, we are a remarkably diverse co country and that we meet means we need to be better in our own place and having safe but difficult conversations. That's not about politics, that's about promoting social cohesion and really making the most of our diversity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Lots in there to pick up. Um in terms of the role of technology, in terms of picking up pace and those, the need for um, integrated sector strategies as we move forward. So we'll, we'll come back and pick up on some of those themes. Uh, but let's go to you, Teresa. What's top of mind for you as we think about the future of New Zealand? Thanks, Zena. Well, actually, I'm going to start where you started and where Peter finished because diversity is top of mind for me. And as you say, we are a diverse country but it's the I we need to work on, diversity and inclusion. Diversity is about being invited to the party. As you say, 40% of our population identifies as Māori, Pacifica or Asian. But inclusion is about being asked to dance when you're at the party. It's about feeling like you belong. It's about feeling valued. It's about feeling that you can bring your best self to the work you're doing, to your mahi, 
to your communities, to your country. And in that is the, the genesis, the seed of New Zealand's leadership potential position in the world. Because we're small enough and we're big enough to do this in a way that the world will take notice, partly because we are further ahead in the way that we are trying to live as several peoples together, and in particular, the decades of striving to do better in terms of commitment to uh, the welfare of our Indigenous peoples and honouring the treaty than most other nations on this earth, and people know that. Also, in part, because we're further ahead in acknowledging, electing female leaders, acknowledging women's leadership, and again, Wahine Māori leadership. So many of the runangas are led by women. It is amazing the difference that is actually making to working with communities and doing things with communities and co-design, not to communities or for communities. And this diversity and inclusion is really a focus of a lot of corporates now. Um, Deloitte did some research recently in Australia that showed that companies that had inclusive cultures were six times more innovative and able to anticipate change and respond effectively and twice as better in terms of financial return, financial rewards than companies that had less inclusive cultures. So as a business person, both involved with large corporates and with entrepreneurs, I think that we need to accelerate the focus in this area. A practical way to do that is for people to become members of Global Woman as an individual and to become corporate partners of Global Woman if you're a corporate, a government department, an industry association. We run programs which help individual companies, but also the collective energy of the Champions for Change, learn more about how to make gender diversity real, lead inclusive cultures, ethnic diversity. All those things in a joined up way can significantly shift the dial on what leadership looks like in New Zealand. That's the first thing. The second thing is entrepreneurship. It really runs in New Zealand's DNA. And if you look at the list of the 25 um, young women under 20 that the YWCA has just said is this their group for this year, you won't find one person there who's got a paid salary job. They're all entrepreneurs for profit or social entrepreneurs, or in some case, just activists. That thinking that it's all about the workforce, the labour market, is an unhelpful, outdated way to think about people and our mahi and Aotearoa. It's all, it's no longer you have a job and maybe you have a side hustle. It's a side hustle, a side hustle, a side hustle, and maybe a bit of paid something on the side as a contract. It's all about the hustle. That is the way increasingly of the future. And it's also a source of great hope because some of the best entrepreneurs of our generation, many of them women, who are showing the way to deal with some of our challenges. I just want to mention here just one. Of course, there's many, but there's not time, but just one. Rebecca Pekaski, Better Packaging, have just launched Plastic Packaging made out of pollution. People paid a fair wage to pick up plastic from the beaches and turn it into packaging. So it's not about making the whenua, it's, it's not about making things do no harm, it's about making the whenua, the moana, the land, the sea, the air better than we found it. That's the challenge that our young people are calling out and business can lead in that. There's generally, I think, all around the world, a bit of a distrust of government, less in New Zealand than elsewhere. <coughs> and in some parts of the world, and for some major companies globally, there's a distrust of business. But in New Zealand, we're small enough to actually know who the leaders are, who the founders are, and individuals trust individuals. So I do really believe that in a joined up way between government and business, entrepreneurs and corporates, we could lead the world in addressing some of the challenges that you outlined in your introductory remarks if we truly focus on the benefits coming out of diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much, Theresa. And just picking your point on, on inclusion, 
my personal view is that if I felt included, I'd be planning the party um, and not waiting for someone to invite me to dance. But as a Global Women member, I can attest to the amazing work that Global Women does. And I know all our premier partners for the APEC CEO Summit are also supporting um, Champions for Change. We'll pick on your point around entrepreneurship um, shortly, but one of the things you talked about was um, Indigenous women leaders. So let's hear from one of them. Christina, what's next for New Zealand in your view? Kia ora e hoa. Tuatahi ai o ki te rangi, ai o ki te whenua, ai o ki ngā, ai o ki ngā iwi takitaku o te ao, ti hei mauri ora. E mihana ki ngā atua Māori. Ka tukana tōku aroha ki ngā iwi takitaku o te ao. E mihana ki te mana whenua o tēnei whenua i raroi o ku waiwai, ko te ati awa, e mihana. E mihana ki a koe e hoa, ki a koutou. E hikaka nau ki te noho i tēnei tepu mo tēnei kōrero hirahira. Me mihi au ki tōku me te ko Rachel Toilele mo tēnei āheinga kei te mihi a hoa. Kia ora e te whānau. Some things that are top of mind for me, I think one of the key things is that I've addressed in my mihi just before, is the importance of our Indigenous wisdom in this space. And um, my heart was inflated, my heart was activated from the kōrero, from my uncle, I'm going to say that now, um, David Suzuki. Everything that he shared yesterday just lit a fire within me. And what I thought about that in relation to what's next for Aotearoa is when we think about some of the key, the key themes from this two-day summit for the APEC um, CEO Summit around kaitiakitanga, around sustainability, digital disruption, the future of energy, and the primacy of trust. Every single part of this, Indigenous peoples have navigated all of these challenges and all of these opportunities for generations, for hundreds of years, for thousands of years. And Indigenous peoples have demonstrated the value that they have and that they bring by virtue of existing. I say that because when we're born, we have so much wisdom imparted in our DNA from our tupuna, from our ancestors who have paved the way for us. And in a lot of that, and at the crux of that, is the knowledge of our interconnectedness and our interdependence on the taiao, on our environment, and tangata, on people. We've heard this over the last two days. He te he tangata. Noreira, for me, it is around that indigenous wisdom and to uh, just add on to the kōrero that's already been shared, we might as well weave together our kōrero from Tāpita and over to you as well, Teresa. We've talked about diversity. We've talked about diversity and inclusion. And I also want to touch on um, equity. For me, when I reflect on our position as Māori and Aotearoa, you know, we have been fighting the long fight for a long time, Fano, and we still are. We are still feeling the effects of colonisation and the many tentacles that this holds um, structurally and systemically. And so for me, in this space where we are wanting to activate change all around the world, how can we look in our own whare? How can we look in our own backyard and ensure that the opportunities that should be provided to the mana whenua, the people that have called Aotearoa home first and continue to call Aotearoa home, that those opportunities are being presented to them. In our statistics so far, we can see, and I'm sure we all know, that Māori are on the back foot for so many reasons, e ma, and that just makes me so angry. And I think this is actually an opportunity for all of us going forward. How do we journey alongside that Indigenous wisdom to level up as a country? How do we role model being really great partners alongside First Nations people, alongside Indigenous peoples of the land, when we are um, operating our businesses, when we're doing anything, it's just the basis of being a good human. And Rachel, yesterday, Rachel Tolele touched on um, being a good tupuna, being a good ancestor. How are we ensuring that all of the mahi, all the work that we're doing now is actually laying down the foundation for us to be remembered as really good Tupuna, really good ancestors for those to come. Another thing that's top of mind for me, Ahua, before I pass it back to you, is the voices of our taitamariki, of our taiohi, of our young people. This is a heart space for me and all the mahi that I do in being of service to young people. 
um, to remind them of their rangatiratanga, to remind them of their chiefly status, as well as reminding them of their entrepreneurial whakapapa. This runs through our veins. And what might it look like if we were able to activate and remind that in the young people? What would the world look like? And I listened to the conversation, to the kōrero um, of our young leaders who uh, shared some of their whakaro, their wero, their challenge to all of us was around, um, you know, we're in a climate crisis. We've got to do something about it. We can't just keep writing memos or making agreements. We need action now. That's what we're hearing from young people. So what are we going to do to be good tupuna and respond to that? How are we taking into consideration education and what does edu good education look like? How are we ensuring that everyone has access to that education? If I think of some of my whānau up and far north who may not have access to an internet or a device, how are they still able to access that beautiful mātauranga, not only of their ancestors, but of all of the whānau who call Aotearoa home, as well as our hauora, our wellbeing? How are we making sure that Whilst we want to change the world in so many different ways, how are we creating positive change within our own being, within our own selves, and with our whānau as well? Those are some key things that are popping off for me, namely Indigenous wisdom, how can we be led by Indigenous ways of doing and being, as being kaitiaki of the world for so long, and how do we actually listen? Not in a tokenistic way. How do we actually open our ears, our hearts and our minds to what young people, the, future, the leaders of right now and tomorrow, to what they're actually telling us and get over our own egos and just do what we need to do for them to be good tupuna. Kia ora, Christina. Uh, lots in there as well around Indigenous wisdom, around young leaders, and I uh, especially want to pick up on the point around education. So throughout this summit, we've heard from speakers uh, about the impact of COVID-19 on jobs. We've also heard uh, also from Sir Peter about, you know, the digital acceleration that is occurring across industries around the world and, and needs to in New Zealand in areas that it's not, and also in our homes. And Christina, you touched on this in terms of the digital divide in particular. We've also heard about new industries emerging. And, and again, Peter, you referenced some of this and um, the need for new technologies in terms of energy, in terms of food production to accelerate sustainability initiatives. So all of these have implications for education, for training uh, and the future of work, as, as Teresa talked about. How do we ensure that our education and training provisions are adequate for addressing the need for these new skills and also in terms of role displacement? Well, I actually think we need total redesign of our education system for young people. It starts with the very young, soon after they're born, to think about the skills of executive functions that need to happen in that, that very first few, few years of life. We need to realise that, that the real skills of empathy, of, of executive functions, of interacting with people, of planning, occur, develop before you enter school. And we don't even think about that period. We need to rethink our education system through school. Why is not every child in every part of New Zealand got digital access, got access to coding, getting access to a number of, of skills that are now going to be normal in their life? We need to rethink that education is not going to be learning about facts, but a broader range of literacies beyond just reading, writing and numeracy to a broad range of other kinds of literacies, civic liter uh, literacies, financial literacies, social literacies, multicultural literacies. I mean, New Zealand is unique and we have a bicultural heritage and a multicultural presence. And we're still trying to work out how that works. But until we have intercultural competencies, not just Maori Pākehā, but across those broad range of people that make up our society, the strength of it will not be there. And it's only from that strength that we can actually be a significant player beyond New Zealand. And at the moment, I think we do too many things uh, as little companies that don't know how to join together to make something bigger. And I think we, 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 when I've studied this, we have more, most of our businesses are below 50 people in size, the most proportionately of any OECD country. That is not a way of being competing with the world. And so we need to think of ways to scale 
and that means other forms of diversity, building on the kinds of things that Tarina and Christina have talked about, not just personal, but social diversity as well. And so there's a lot we could do, but it needs fundamental rethinking, and that means brave discussions, which this country is not very good at having. Thank you. Um, so, Peter, Teresa, I'm going to come to you to pick on what Sir Peter talked about and also what you talked about earlier, um, you know, his points around the size of our businesses, uh, and you raised the point earlier around entrepreneurship. How, can you train for entrepreneurship? How do we create more entrepreneurs? And in terms of women entrepreneurs in particular, which you talked about, how do we ensure that they have access to the same kinds of fundings? Because as we know, um, they don't necessarily have access to the same levels of fundings that other entrepreneurs do. Oh, Zena, I'm sure you asked me this question because you know I'm so passionate about this money. Um, well, first of all, um, I am funding a chair in Women in Entrepreneurship at Auckland University for this very reason, because I think women go to university, uh, it's, it's, it's in business school, but even at business school, women aren't brought up to take risks the way that boys do. They're not brought up to think about money in the same way. So you shouldn't assume that just because we've got more women in business school than when I went through, the field is going to be equal for them when they come out. And I also set this up because, like I said before, we're all going to be self-employed at some point in the next few years. And the young woman today, what jobs they'll do, don't exist today. So mm. as Peter said, it's the qualities, it's, this, it's rather than the particular training. But there are some things that you do need to understand. And so getting a university course that has mana, but interfaces and works with some of the best female entrepreneurs of our generation is really something that I'm very passionate about. And of course, I also brought SHEO to New Zealand, which is all about providing a safe environment to fund women entrepreneurs in a different way and to coach and mentor and support them in a way that is safe and to really help women hang on to more equity in their businesses, not sell down too soon and to feel supported doing things that matter to the world. You have to be changing the world in a positive way to become one of our ventures. So that's mm. just a few things. There are now more organisations in New Zealand supporting women entrepreneurs, Company of Women, Archangels. Mm. Um, I'm working with the Ice House Ventures on getting a seriously big fund up for women entrepreneurs to invest only in female-led businesses, not just They've done one fund and that's fine, but it's only a couple of million. A fund that could actually lead deals because it's always women asking. We've now got this fund for entrepreneurs who are going global, Peter's point, but there's no gender lens on that. And so, again, I worry that it will tend to favour male entrepreneurs. So for those of us women in this space, we do have to keep leading and we have to keep doing it, as Christina said, in a, in, a, in a way that actually holds hands together. And I'm really conscious that Wahini Māori women have a lot of their own organisations in this space. Putama, Māori Women's Development Corporation, they don't have to work with the organisations that white women have set up. But there are some like Kerry Nathan who walk in both worlds, who are part of mm. both ecosystems. And that is a way that women can show leadership in New Zealand in that joined up way that all three of us have been talking about. So I think that that is really important, that we actually mm -hmm. don't just stay in the worlds that we're comfortable in, but that we actually do say, OK, we, we, there is value in a collective effort here, a collective inspiration and way forward for the country. Thank you. Um, I am very conscious that we're going to very quickly run out of time and there's, there's lots of... Um, inspiration coming through and lots of really useful advice and insights coming through as well. I want to go back to Sir Peter's earlier comments about New Zealand's place in the world. And, you know, this, this last two days has been about the APEC CEO summit, but the whole year has been about New Zealand's leadership of APEC. And I want all three of you to think about, you know, 21 years from now when it's our turn to host APEC next. What changes would you have liked to have seen New Zealand uh, and our businesses in particular take in that time, or our institutions generally. Christina, I'll come to you first. Why not, you know, you talked about ESG, and if there was an acronym that was most popular uh, in the summit, it was that, and you talked about Indigenous wisdom. So I'm going to pose one of your own questions back to you. How do we take that Indigenous wisdom? How do we take Mataranga Māori and bring it into the mainstream? Nga mahi e Hi, when I think of um, the key quarter from Rangi Māori Ahunia today, 
and I totoko 1000%. Indigenous peoples, we are the rongoa. We are the solution. We have the solutions. What does it look like for us to implement it in Aotearoa and to the globe? First of all, it's actually building that relationship and that trust with Indigenous peoples. You can't just jump in there and say, hey, you're Māori, tell us how you do the Māori things and then we'll put it into our business. That's just not going to work. What I invite everyone to do is to focus on building trust. How do we actually go and follow the cup of tea methodology? Just go and spend time with the community leaders. Uh, and we have so many amazing Māori community uh, leaders a part of APEC. Just go and spend some time with them, get to know them. Importantly, I'll probably give you three points. One is actually to build that trust and that relationship, whakawhanaungatanga, relationship building. Secondly, it's about actually doing your own research. Go on a journey yourself. For Māori, we have been navigating so many emotions when riding the waves of continued colonisation, understanding our identity, trying to reclaim our identity. We don't have the extra energy to carry the weight of your guilt or anyone else wanting to try and be educated about what our experience is like. So my ask, please, is for everyone to just go on a journey yourself. Ko wayo, who am I and what do I know about the history of Aotearoa? And finally, it's around preparing yourself to step aside and let Indigenous people, let young people lead the way. How to, for us to be able to take Indigenous mapauranga to Aotearoa businesses and to the world, it's recognising that there are times where we need to stand alongside each other as we do journey. But there are times that maybe we need to take a step back and actually just know that Indigenous wisdom has survived for so long and will continue to survive. But we can just leave it to those who have that knowledge to, to lead the way. Kia ora. Thank you, Christina. Now, Teresa and Peter, I'm going to come to you for just one thing uh, because we don't have the time for more than that. So, Teresa, what's your one thing that you would have liked to see change? Um, what Christina mentioned, really a strong bridge between the Te Ao Māori world and Te Ao Pākehā world throughout New Zealand. And then the second thing is co-design. It's what, it's what you were talking about at the beginning, Zena. It's about you designing the party, not being asked to dance in the party. I see too much of government doing it their way or business doing it their way. I see amazing stuff happens. Look at Kotuitui and Papakura, that community. When you embody the principle of co-design, centre that, all activity around that, the community has the wisdom. And so embody co-design, you will then find a way to embody Indigenous wisdom and female leadership without actually forcing people to do something that isn't intuitively how they want to operate. Thank you very much. And Peter, you have the last word. We have to navigate a number of difficult conversations and both Theresa and Christina has identified part of it. But if we don't able to have discussions which bring all the parties, not just government alone and not just partisan politics to the table to navigate the various transformations, social, economic, uh, politic, geostrategic, uh, dealing with climate change, dealing with rapid technological change. This country will not be cohesive and this country will not take advantage and, and meet the stewardship of the land and the people which we're all here to help. And therefore, I think the most important thing is we need to somehow lift our ability to have difficult conversations in safe ways. And they take time and they're hard on everybody, but the part of this country moving forward to be a truly uh, I guess, how would I put it, indigenously inspired democracy of the mid 21st century. Thank you all so much um, for your amazing insights, your thought provoking uh, perspectives, talking about difficult conversations. Um, there is much to celebrate about being a Kiwi and living in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but there is also work to do to ensure that we build a sustainable and inclusive future which all New Zealanders can enjoy and benefit from. And if I was to leave you with one thought today as we close this session, I will go to what Christina talked about earlier. And it is this. He aha te mea nui o te ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. What is the most important thing in the world? It is people. It is people. It is people. 
Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa.